Hello, St. Christopher the Martyr Parish. This is Deacon Phil. Uh, I send my love and my prayers to all of you. And on behalf of Father Raymond, I also sends his prayers and his love to all parishioners uh, and all those uh, viewing this video, especially also to his friends and family throughout the world in Nigeria, Italy, and the United Kingdom. I wanted to do a brief meditation today on Psalm 51. Uh, as you know, there's 150 Psalms. Seven of them are referred to as the penitential Psalms. And perhaps the most famous uh, is Psalm 51. It's under its Latin title, it's known as Miserere, which you know that um, Latin was the language of the church for many centuries. And the hymns and prayers were given names based upon typically the first word or two. And so this is referred to as the Miserere because the opening words are have mercy. And so um, this particular psalm was written during the time of the exile, the Babylonian exile, the second and final exile, in which the Babylonians came and not only took uh, most of the remaining citizens and leaders and put them into exile throughout Babylon and surrounding areas, but um, even worse was they destroyed the temple, the temple which was the symbol and the, the presence and the strength of, of the one true God and was always the surety that the people of Judah had was their temple. And when that was destroyed, um, their lives uh, seem to have been destroyed. And so I've mentioned before how we can certainly align ourselves as kindred souls, although what's happened to us is far less catastrophic. Nevertheless, uh, for those who have lost jobs, those who have lost or may lose their businesses, for all of us who aren't able to go to the temple, although it's not been destroyed, we're, we're barred from going, um, it, it, we, we can align ourselves a little bit and understand in, in some way what they may have been going through. And back then, you know, it would have been easy to blame others as people were in exile, to get angry at their leaders, to get angry um, at their God, at our God, the one true God, and say, you know, the pagans are laughing at us. Uh, we claim that we have the one true God and he, his presence is in the temple. That's been destroyed, and so now they laugh at us, and they tell us, apparently your God isn't God. It must be the Babylonian gods that are more powerful than your God, because look what we've done to your temple. And so it would be very easy to lose faith and to spend time in anger and bitterness against others. And I see a lot of that going on in the press today. You know, they're so quick to want to look to blame others and to blame certain politicians uh, it depends on who they like, it seems, you know, so um, whatever happens, you either did something too soon or you did something too late or you did too much, you didn't do enough. It's just constant complaining and, and, and finger pointing. And that's not only uncharitable, but so unproductive. And we need to detach ourselves from that. Um, and that's thankfully what so many of the people of Judah did during this exile, rather than spend time in anger against God, against their leaders, against their fellow countrymen. They had time to spend an exile in prayer and contemplation and look internally. And so we need to take that lesson. Don't get caught up in the, the uh, fanning of the flames that the press loves to do, the dividing that the, that the press loves to do. Uh, but rather, let's look on ourselves and say, what is it about us? What, what is it that, that we need to do? And so this particular psalm was just that, where the people of Judah looked in on themselves as so many beautiful passages, psalms, and uh, sections of books. Jeremiah and Ezekiel have wonderful prayers and, uh, that, that came out of being in exile. So it was a great time for holiness. And so we can also, again, like thousands of years ago, use this as a great time for holiness, but not by pointing the finger of others, but looking internally on ourselves. And this is, I'll, I'll read the first couple of uh, paragraphs here as to the result of some of that prayerful contemplation that this, that this uh, psalm came from. Have mercy on me, God, in your kindness. In your compassion, blot out my offense. Oh, wash me more and more from my guilt and cleanse me from my sin. My offenses, truly I know them. My sin is always before me. Against you, you alone have I sinned. What is evil in your sight I have done. What, what a beautiful opening two paragraphs that is. And what a beautiful attitude that this author has. And I, and I think he reflects so many of the faithful of Judah at that time. The realization that we needed to look internally, that 
they're responsible for their own actions. They're responsible and they understand their fallenness. They understand their, their guilt, but so wonderfully. And here we are just coming out of Divine Mercy Sunday uh, a couple weeks ago. This beautiful opening, have mercy on me, God. Mercy. It seems like God has scourged them, had them torn away from their homeland, had their country destroyed. Uh, the Davidic kingdom, for all intents and purposes, was gone. Uh, it was no longer. How, how could there be a promise of an eternal uh, successor to the king, to the throne of David, when the, line, the lineage of the kingdom is gone? And, um, you know, their temple was destroyed. And yet they still rely anew on God's mercy. God's mercy. And here Jesus is telling us through Divine Mercy Sunday, come to my mercy. They recognize that. In your compassion, blot out my offense. And the next section, a wash me more and more from my guilt and cleanse me from my sin. You may recognize that. And I always said that the best, best Catholics are converts and the best converts are Jewish converts. And I believe that that's because they recognize how much we embrace the Old Testament in our liturgy. Uh, we don't turn our back on it. And if you might recall, of course, most of the time during Mass, there's music going on during the uh, offertory. But if it ends or if there isn't music, when the priest turns to the altar service to wash his hands, this is the prayer that he utters. Oh, wash me more and more of my guilt and cleanse me from my sin. A beautiful thing. And so my offenses, truly I know them. My sin is always before me. Against you, you alone have I sinned. So there's the recognition while they were in exile, this time of holiness, that it was each person was responsible for themselves and each one of them needed to seek God's mercy and God's forgiveness. And then the next one says that you may be justified when you give sentence and be without reproach when you judge. Oh, see, in guilt I was born, a sinner was I conceived. Now, this is truly where the Holy Spirit, uh, we know, has inspired the, the authors in Scripture. And here, there was no, no concept or theology or teaching of original sin. And yet here is the first inclination of a recognition of that. It would take centuries, obviously, millennia before this would be um, understood or at least confirmed. But here it is that it says, Oh, see, in guilt I was born, a sinner was I conceived. And that just as a recognition to God that when we're born, we are in need from the moment we're conceived. In fact, uh, we are in need of his mercy. Uh, we are in need of his compassion and his love. And so it was a recognition of that. Indeed, you love truth in the heart. Then in the secret of my heart, teach me wisdom. Oh, purify me, then I shall be clean. Oh, wash me, I shall be whiter than snow. And so here, right after, again, the Holy Spirit's inspiration on this particular author, that just after recognizing what would later to become known as original sin, that in sin we are conceived, that we ask to be washed. Cleanse me, purify me, Lord. And of course, it would be through baptism that, that, is, that we are truly purified and cleansed of our sin. Make me here rejoicing in gladness that the bones you have crushed may revive. From my sins, turn away your face and blot out all my guilt. Again, looking to God and understanding that his mercy and love, that he won't, he won't hold that against us. If we turn to him with humble and contrite hearts, he is not going to reject his mercy from us, even though they were in exile in such dire straits. Now, this is a very interesting um, um, uh, section here. A pure heart, great for me, O God. Put a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, nor deprive me of your Holy Spirit. Now, again, Holy Spirit, again, there's a little bit. This isn't capital Holy Spirit. This is not uh, the, the, the author recognizing that there's a Trinity or that there's even a God and a Holy Spirit. That God. But it's just interesting how these things slowly began to seep into the knowledge as the Jewish people began to try to come to a better understanding and a better relationship with God. But the very first sentence here, a pure heart create for me, O God, and put a steadfast spirit within me. So the previous section refers to baptism. And here this really starts referring to uh, confirmation, uh, that the word here create for me. Now, this isn't evident as, as much as, as it is in the original Hebrew, but that word create, there are a number of words for create. You know, you can create a chair. You can, um, you know, create things from your hands. 
But this particular word create in Hebrew uh, is only used when referred to God's creation. And so someone who knows Hebrew and would read, be reading this in Hebrew back then and the author who wrote it and such, use that word specifically because it's the very first verb in Scripture, in Genesis, where God created the world. And that is the same Hebrew word, and it is only used in Scripture for when God creates. So here, when we're asking, create a new heart for me, a pure heart for me, we're telling that it is only God that can create a pure heart, because that word create is reserved only for God who creates. And so a pure heart create for me, O God. They had realized that their hearts had a fault with it. That fault was original sin. And they needed grace to overcome it. So the grace of baptism purifies it. But then they needed something to give it strength, to continue so that they wouldn't fall again. We know in the Old Testament, we know in our own lives, we receive forgiveness, but then we fall. We receive forgiveness and then we fall. Um, our hearts are weak, but when we receive baptism, we're given that initial purification. And then confirmation and, of course, Eucharist, the graces we receive from the sacraments, we receive additional strength. We, we receive that, that, the, the grace to have that steadfast spirit, put a steadfast spirit within me. That comes through by continuing going to receive the sacraments. And, of course, the sacrament of confirmation in which that we will not be deprived of this Holy Spirit, in which a steadfast spirit would be will be put within us. And so that our hearts that are purified when we fall again can be made pure again through the continuing graces uh, that only God can give us because he has put this new heart into us. It's not our old hearts are gone. He has put a new pure heart in us and our spirit, the graces we receive, is strengthens us and helps us to be able to, to keep our heart pure and to seek forgiveness through, uh, through confession so that, again, we can be renewed in the spirit. Give me again the joy of your help. With a spirit of fervor, sustain me. So there is a wonderful, again, your, your spirit will sustain me. Your waters will cleanse me. Your spirit will sustain me. And this is very lovely here, too. It says that I may teach transgressors your ways and sinners may return to you. So here's a wonderful thing that while the Jewish people were turning internally on themselves in a contemplative way in exile, to say what's happened, they had to try to make sense of this. If they still believe God is the one true God, the all-powerful God, and the Babylonian gods are false, uh, then how does this make sense? Their temple will get destroyed. And, and so while they looked in on their own sinfulness and that they needed a new heart, they needed a new heart that needed to be purified, and then a new heart that would um, that then would be cleansed, purified, and then strengthened with the Spirit. But then now it would be their mission to teach transgressors your ways and return, and, and, and sinners may return to you. And again, there's our apostolic calling. This isn't just about us. We're baptized and we're, and we're purified. Now this new heart that God has given us, this pure heart that we receive graces to, 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 to sustain us, and that's all we do. Now we're called to help transgressors, to show others that sinners may return to you. And so there's that apostolic calling, even back in Psalm 51, that we're to bring this, this vision and this hope to others of God's mercy, God's love, that he will put a new heart in you and purify you with the waters and then sustain you through the spirit, through the graces of the sacraments in our faith. O oh, rescue me, God, my helper, and my tongue shall ring out your goodness. O oh, Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall declare your praise. That particular section there is every morning, uh, every morning prayer begins with that throughout the world. O oh, Lord, oh, Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall declare your praise. And so here again is telling God, all these things are so wonderful. It's so wonderful. We can't keep this wonderfulness in. We can't keep this beauty of God's willing to give us a, a pure heart, a completely new heart, and his spirit to allow us to be sustained, that we want to wring out this goodness to others so that sinners may return to him. And of course, again, they begin learning, for, for in sacrifice you take no delight, burn offering for me you would refuse. My sacrifice, a contrite spirit, a humble, contrite heart you will not spurn. And this is, again, one of the great miracles out of this exile, was the realization that up until that point, 
It was always, so long as you show up in Jerusalem so many times a year, so long as you make the sacrifice of your wheat, your grain, your oil, your rams, your bullocks, whatever it is, so long as you fulfill those things, God, good enough. You've done what you need to do. But then when you go back and you live your life and you're transgressing and sinning, those sacrifices you made mean nothing. And so they realize that in exile, that sacrifice, you take no delight. These bulls that you give, but our hearts aren't pure, mean nothing to you. And they realize my sacrifice must be a contrite spirit, a humbled contrite heart. God will not spurn. It is a far better sacrifice, a far better offering we give to, to God when we come with our hearts that are humbled and say, Lord, I'm brought low. Forgive me. Give me your spirit to sustain me, and I shall ring out your goodness and help others return to you. I will proclaim your wonders to others. And your goodness shall favor to Zion, rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, that you will be pleased with lawful sacrifice, holocaust offered on your altar. So again, now they're referring to that future hope, that future hope that, Lord, if we, we realize now it's our sinfulness, we realize it's only you that can create a new heart in us, a pure heart. It's only your waters that can wash and clean us and keep us pure. It's only your spirit that can sustain us. It's no longer us. It's only a humble, contrite heart that will make you happy. And when we do these things, then Jerusalem will be rebuilt again, that future promise of what would become the future and eternal Jerusalem in which God's goodness and favor will be ours for all eternity. So brothers and sisters, I hope that this has been helpful to you to meditate upon this. Spend some time with this psalm, read it over slowly as I did, and just look at each part and think back 2,000 years or more than that, thousands of years ago uh, to when the Jews were in exile, and then look in your own self and your own condition now and understand how these very much apply uh, to us today and our condition and God's mercy just as back then is with us today. God love you. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.